Since the dawn of time, the concept of fate versus freedom has fascinated mankind. Early ancient Greek thinkers believed that the gods chose our fates, which is called predestination. Later thinkers, like Democritus, came up with the idea that human behaviour was caused by atoms obeying rigid natural laws, which is called determinism. But celebrated philosophers like Aristotle and Socrates stated that humans had free will and were not helplessly bound by the gods or atomic laws, and the argument has raged ever since. I will define free will simply as the ability to choose between different options. I would like to state from the outset that I reject all supernatural explanations of free will, as a belief in God is an extraordinary claim with very little evidence to support it. I am also aware that thinkers far greater than I have tackled this, but I nonetheless hope to add a few original thoughts. The standard argument against free will claims that every event including the mind's decisions, is caused entirely by previous events. Therefore, there can only be one possible future. This is strict determinism, hereafter just called determinism. Determinism holds that a human action, like eating porridge for breakfast, was determined at the start of the universe by particles moving in entirely predictable paths in a 13.7 billion year long chain of cause and effect. A determinist holds that although you may think you could have chosen to eat an omelette or a cereal, you eating porridge inevitably happened because you had a will to eat porridge, which was determined by your character and your past experiences, which was in turn determined by other people, your genes and your environment. This clockwork universe determinism seems like a brutally overpowering argument that has significant consequences for moral responsibility. It holds that one's success or failure is just a matter of luck and that our choices are illusions. Determinism leads to fatalism and very negative individual and societal consequences. It is not necessarily catastrophic, but I believe history shows societies with a high belief in free will are more prosperous than societies with a higher belief in fate. This is shown by how the West has soared to incredible heights since the Industrial Revolution started, off the back of a belief that you can do anything you set your mind to, while other places stagnated on dogmas of religious predestination. The first modern scientific argument for determinism came as a result of Isaac Newton's publishing of his Three Laws of Motion and the Law of Gravitation in 1687. These could predict many things, like the orbits of planets, the path of a thrown object, and ocean tides. People asked, if inanimate objects' behaviour is determined by these natural laws, then surely human and animal behaviour is determined by them too. Determinists touted Newtonian physics as undeniably perfect evidence for determinism. But Newton's natural laws could not explain a number of problems, like Mercury's orbit. It was incomplete. So in 1915, Albert Einstein published the general theory of relativity, which says gravity is the warping of space by objects with mass, and this warping affects time too. This is expressed by the equation E equals mc squared. The more massive an object, the more time dilates. He also stated light travels at a constant speed. This could explain more phenomena like redshift and the bending of light. Determinists like Einstein himself were sure that this time this really was undeniably perfect evidence for determinism. But still, Einstein's general relativity could not explain a number of problems like an expanding universe. It was again incomplete. So Max Planck and others in the 1920s finalised quantum theory. This says that microscopic particles 
behave in very unpredictable ways, that light behaves like a particle and a wave, and that observing a particle changes that particle. Quantum theory says you can never know with certainty both the position and speed of a particle. And this is not because our measuring instruments are not advanced enough. It is fundamental. This is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can only know the probability of a particle being somewhere. This means that the universe is fundamentally indeterminate. The determinists were shocked and didn't believe this at first, since they assumed science was the same thing as deterministic laws. They tried to say there were local hidden variables, but there are none, as proven by Bell's inequality theorem. To this day, many determinist arguments outright ignore that the universe is fundamentally indeterminate, which proves their idea of an unbroken chain of cause and effect going back to the Big Bang is bogus. An event can cause itself. Modern day physics best theory is the standard model from the 1970s, but this still cannot explain important problems like why neutrinos have mass. It is again incomplete. The standard model says three types of particles called quarks, leptons and bosons are the tiniest building block in the universe and these interact with each other via four forces called the strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force and gravitational force in ways that determine macroscopic events. For example, specific quarks make up protons and the number of protons determine what element the atom is. One proton is hydrogen and two is helium. Also, other specific quarks make up neutrons and the number of neutrons determine what isotope or form of the element it is. The number of electrons, a type of lepton, determines how the atom reacts with other atoms. Hence, we can understand an event like the rusting of iron very well. Here, iron atoms with 26 protons lose two negatively charged electrons from their outer orbital and so become positively charged. These electrons react with oxygen and water molecules in a predictable way to form hydrated iron oxide or rust. Determinists say that because science is getting better at explaining the world, that eventually it will certainly explain that the mind is nothing but a complex mechanism operating in a determined way, like a clock. But this ignores that quantum indeterminism, for one, is here to stay. And who's to say there aren't other forms of indeterminism, like agential indeterminism? Neuroscience. Determinists next turn to neuroscience, which is a discipline comparatively in its infancy, only really getting going in the 1960s. There seems to be a common mistake made by determinists, which is that pointing out patterns of human behavior does not prove that that behavior is not free. Indeed, it would be rather worrying if humans did not have patterns. The main neuroscience evidence that determinists completely disproves free will is Benjamin Libet's 1983 experiment. Previously, it had been discovered that an electrical potential of a few microvolts was visible in the brain long before a subject flexes their finger. This was called the readiness potential. In the experiment, a subject had a screen on with a dot circulating like the hand of a clock and the subject was asked to note the position of the dot when they were aware of the conscious decision to move their finger. EEG sensors picked up a readiness potential several hundred milliseconds before people reported a conscious decision to move their finger. Determinists said this proved for certain that people's choices were determined by unconscious neural activity. Free will was dead forever, they exulted, and you were a fool at best to keep on believing in it. However, it became clear they had jumped to conclusions. First of all, Libet himself never thought it destroyed free will. I quote, Our own experimental findings showed that conscious free will does not initiate the final act now process. 
the initiation of it occurs unconsciously. But as discussed previously, conscious will certainly has the potentiality to control the progress and outcome of the volitional process. He also believed you could veto the finger flicking action when you became consciously aware you were about to do it. More importantly, this my neurons made me do it conclusion largely rested on the assumption that the readiness potential caused the action. This was a classic science mistake, but rather showed determinists were affected by confirmation bias as much as anyone else. Correlation is not causation. And in 2010, worse was to come. Dr. Aaron Scherger of the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research knew that brain activity naturally goes up and down in the brain like the waves on an ocean. This brain activity is just noise. Scherger thought this noise might undermine Libet's conclusion. I quote from Lab Roots. Scherger and colleagues repeated a version of Libet's experiment in a paper under review for publication at Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences to avoid cherry picking brain noise, they included a control condition in which participants did not move at all. An artificial intelligence program enabled them to find the moment when brain activity in the two conditions differed. If Libet were right, brain activity should have diverged at 500 milliseconds before the movement, but the algorithm spotted the difference just 150 milliseconds before the movement, precisely when people reported making decisions in Libet's original experiment. In other words, people's subjective experience of a decision matched the actual moment their brains showed signs of making a decision. Libet's findings were debunked. So, Scherger's experiment is a significant argument for conscious free will. He identifies another problem with Libet's conclusion, which I quote, Most importantly, our work may help to resolve Libet's paradox. Why should there be such a long and highly variable gap between the time of a motor decision and the subjective estimate of the time of the motor decision? In fact, this question arises only when we assume that the motor decision coincides in time with the onset of the RP. And another problem. Simulations showed that when the model is interrupted at random times, forced to produce a speeded response, the fastest responses are preceded by a gradual build-up in the direction of the threshold that long precedes the interruption itself, whereas the slower responses are not. Remarkably, we found the same to be true of our empirical data. Thus, the RP, which appears to be an intentional goal-directed build-up, might instead reflect ongoing random fluctuations in neural activity. And Scherger further explains that all the RP seems to really do is make the finger tap faster or slower because a threshold must be reached for the decision to be made which is presumably reached by conscious will. We used a variant of Libet's task that we referred to as Libetus Interruptus. Subjects perform the standard Libet task, but are told that they may sometimes be interrupted by an auditory click, in which case they are to perform the movement, a button press, immediately and as quickly as possible. Our experimental results showed that a decision threshold applied to also correlated noise in this case, the output of a leaky stochastic accumulator can account for the specific shape of the RP, as well as the distribution of waiting times from subjects performing Libet et al.'s spontaneous movement task. So, all signs are that determinists excitedly seized upon a flawed experiment with even more flawed conclusions in a very young science which the experimenter himself thought permitted free will, and proclaimed to all and sundry that free will TM was proven an illusion beyond any doubt. Compatibilism. Compatibilism is a broad doctrine that holds that even though, allegedly, you were always going to do what you did, you still have free will as long as you are free from external coercion. 
In other words, compatibilist philosophers today are determinists who believe in moral responsibility. Incompatibilist determinists do not. The first compatibilists were ancient Greeks, but Christian writers gave it more thought. They struggled with how to reconcile God's omniscience, which includes knowledge about everything that will ever happen, with personal liberty. The Enlightenment popularised reason instead of dogma and produced philosophers like David Hume, who argued not for religious predestination, but rather naturalist determinism. Hume argued that an action is performed freely when an agent could have done otherwise, had the agent wanted to. For example, I need to get to a destination and can choose to catch the train, catch the bus or ride a bike there. I choose to bicycle there because I wanted to. I had the will to. Exercise. Compatibilists would say I had free will to do this because no external force outside my control, like the train or bus breaking down, coerced me into choosing to bicycle there. But most, also amazingly, believe that my free choice to get on my bike there was determined from before my birth, right up until the Big Bang. This is not what most people think of when they hear the term free will. The illusion of having a choice is not the same as having a choice. And indeed, compatibilists have just watered down the definition of free will to suit their purposes. This is the basic irredeemable flaw at the heart of compatibilism, which makes it so illogical. The reason why compatibilists try to claim free will and determinism can coexist is because they believe free will is essential to moral responsibility upon which society is founded. They are right to fear a society without moral responsibility. If people believe their good deeds or bad deeds are ultimately determined by the initial sloppy superheated soup of subatomic particles created by the Big Bang, then fatalism would definitely increase. There are scientific experiments showing people cheat and lie more after reading an anti-free will text, but you just need common sense to realise how bad people feeling they're not ultimately in control is. Just look at Muslim countries with a high belief in predestination, exemplified by the inshallah attitude that is correlated with a careless attitude to safety, grinding bureaucracy and underachievement in every sector. And it gets worse. Criminals would start excusing their inexcusable behaviour with strict determinism. The universe made me do bad things. I never had a choice. And why stop there? Addicts would say, the universe made me addicted to drugs. I never had a choice. I'm not saying society would collapse, but it would be severely damaged. This is why compatibilists are keen to maintain free will and determinism are compatible. But the truth is they are not, and compatibilists' attempts to use sophisticated language analysis to argue otherwise are, as William James said, a quagmire of evasion. As a side note, Bob Doyle, the information philosopher, has detailed an interesting position he calls comprehensive compatibilism that emphasises quantum randomness in the mind. First, he heavily criticises how dogmatic determinism has been ever since Leucippus the Greek asserted, nothing occurs by chance, but there is a reason and necessity for everything. Doyle states that adequate determinism is true and strict determinism is false. He justifies this based on the fact that quantum events happen which are not caused by anything. Classical physics thinks of matter as tiny solid particles, but quantum physics describes matter as being able to be both a particle and a wave. So the more matter behaves like a wave, the more quantum and the more indeterminate it is. Classical physics is just easier to use to predict the motion of large objects like a baseball, satellite or planet, because quantum effects tend to average away the more macroscopic a system is. This is called the classical limit. However, quantum indeterminism is always operating, which is why Doyle states correctly determinism is false. Doyle argues that in the brain there is quantum noise and also thermal noise, 
which according to the second law of thermodynamics does not behave predictably, which affects both proper storage of information and accurate retrieval of that information at later times. We know the brain can access quantum phenomena because the nose can detect individual quantum molecules and the eyes a quanta of light. He argues what he calls the micro-mind is constantly generating possible courses of action and is affected by random quantum and thermal noise when doing so. This means the possible courses of action in our mind are not predetermined and cannot be predicted. Doyle then argues the macro-mind suppresses the noise to make an adequately determined decision according to our desires, feelings, character, values, motives and reasons. This of course means that once the random possibilities have been generated in our minds, we have no genuine ability to choose otherwise. This is why Doyle does not believe that the will is free. He thinks the will is bound, but tries, like other compatibilists, to water down the definition of free will by saying nonsensically that free is not an adjective modifying will, but it is. Comprehensive compatibilism is more palatable than determinism because it allows the story of mankind to genuinely branch out in different ways. But it is still unsatisfactory because he believes we don't ultimately control those ways because our desires and beliefs are ultimately determined by actors outside our control. Doyle's failure to prove that free will, as understood by nearly everyone, except ivory tower philosophers can be compatible with adequate determinism, puts the final nail in the coffin of the idea of compatibilism. Libertarianism. Libertarian philosophers argue for the existence of free will and state correctly that determinism and free will are incompatible. They are thus incompatibilists. A few radical libertarians have put across the unintelligible position that our actions are in no way determined by our desires and beliefs, and some religious libertarians claim bizarrely that God has given man a gift of freedom, but at the same time that God's foreknowledge knows everything man will do. Mind-body dualism, as posited by René Descartes, has fallen out of fashion too, but the majority put across the common sense position that our actions are influenced or partly determined by our desires and beliefs, but not necessitated. Agent causalist libertarians since Aristotle have stated agents can start new causal chains that are not predetermined. Dr. Richard Taylor of Brown University expressed it best. The alternative, I urge, is that I am sometimes the cause of my own actions, that the word cause in such contexts has the older meaning of the efficacy or power of an agent to produce certain results. This idea can be otherwise expressed by saying that an agent is something that originates things, produces them, or brings them about. They plausibly say that the modern obsession with reducing men to complex machines is not scientific. The mind is not a computer, that is a simplistic analogy. It is only a bit less crude than thinkers in the Industrial Revolution treating men as being like steam vessels, hence the term blow off some steam. Libertarians state the most important evidence that free will exists is that we sense it does, and discussing a free agent is a more useful way of thinking about decisions than atoms blindly colliding with each other. Indeed, emergentism, a theory of agent causation, I find to be the most convincing and coherent libertarian argument. It contains a slight tinge of Cartesian dualism, but we should not immediately reject this as unscientific, because as quantum indeterminacy has showed us, reality is a far stranger thing than we thought. We should have an open mind and never stop wondering about the nature of things, Emergentists broadly believe that we are greater than the sum of our parts. You cannot entirely explain conscious will 
by looking at individual atoms' behavior, they state. They state, free will is an emergent property of the brain. They point out that it is not just human conscious will that is emergent, but concepts like weather systems, ecosystems, and even unemployment. Professor Timothy O'Connor of Indiana University is a leading emergentist who was mentored by the celebrated Dr. Carl Jeanette. He explains, the agency theorist is committed to the emergence of a very different source of property altogether. Instead of producing certain effects in the appropriate circumstances itself of necessity, this property enables the individual that has it a certain range of circumstances to freely and directly bring about, or not bring about, any of a range of effects, and convincingly defends emergentism against the slander that it is old mind-body dualism dressed up in new clothes. Still, we are not supposing something's coming from nothing, as many have thought. The presence of any emergent in the view I have sketched will be determined by more fundamental features of its possessor. O'Connor also explains downward causation can help human beings break free of seemingly endless upward causation. A natural example of downward causation is a wheel rolling down a hill, taking all of its molecules with it. And a human example is the mind sending a signal to the muscle to contract. Professor Christian List of Munich University is the most recent and prominent emergentist philosopher and is the author of the 29 book, Why Free Will is Real. List explains. The first thing to note is that there are two very different ways in which we can think about human beings. We can either think of them as purely physical systems consisting of gazillions of interacting particles and insist that human behavior is to be understood as nothing but a physical process. Or we can think of humans as not just physical, but also psychological as beings with mental states and cognitive processes that underpin their behavior. Call the first way of thinking the reductionistic one and the second the non-reductionistic one. Basically, there are different levels of science and no level is better than the others. It just has a different purpose. The below humorous cartoon from XKCD pokes fun at the hubris of some physicists in thinking their level of science is better than all the others. So, quantum physics has the purpose of explaining microscopic particles' behavior, classical physics, how large blocks of matter move, chemistry, how matter reacts and has properties, biology, how living beings' unconscious processes happen, psychology, how the human mind works, and sociology, how human relationships work. List affirms that psychology is the most relevant level to the debate, and it supports the idea of free will. Psychology says humans are influenced, yes, but determined, no. There has been no psychology experiment where the researchers could predict exactly what each individual subject would do. Subjects with the same age, gender, genetics, and socioeconomic background behave differently in exactly the same circumstances, which has to provide some evidence for free will, which I repeat is the ability to choose between different options. There is another attack on free will, where the claim is made that the conscious will does not even exist and all decisions are actually made by unconscious brain processes. Consciousness is supposedly simply an awareness of what you're doing and plays no causal role. This is epiphenomenalism. However, the best theories of not just psychology, but soft sciences like history, economics, anthropology, and sociology, List points out, support the idea of an agent with a conscious will is involved in decision making. Are the hard sciences better than the soft sciences? Do the hard sciences even mostly support epiphenomenalism? No and no. Epiphenomenalists try to support their theory by saying that when we observe our mental processes, each and every idea just arises in our heads. We don't consciously choose them. Firstly, I don't think anyone would seriously deny that thoughts do pop into our head seemingly randomly. 
like when we're walking and suddenly wonder what to watch on TV tonight. But saying that once these random courses of action are presented to ourselves and we are conscious of them, then our conscious mind just observes helplessly what our unconscious mind chooses seems absurd and to fly against common sense. Imagine the following dialogue. I just presented you the options of watching The Apprentice, BBC News or Top Gear tonight, says Unconscious. Thanks. I'd like to watch Top Gear, goes Conscious. But we're watching The Apprentice anyway, states Unconscious. Fine, says Conscious. You always make every decision. I don't even know why you keep me around. It seems clear the conscious mind does affect decision making. Another blow to epiphenomenalism is their embrace of Libet's experiments' conclusions, which have been debunked. I am going to quote Liszt's rather convincing emergentism argument at length now. Premise 1. Our best explanations of human behaviour depict humans as choice-making agents, agents with goals and purposes, alternative possibilities to choose from and causal control over their actions. This depiction is indispensable and compatible with the rest of science. If postulating certain properties and entities is indispensable in our best explanations of a given phenomenon and compatible with the rest of science, then we are, at least provisionally, warranted in taking those properties or entities to be real. Putting these two premises together, we arrive at my conclusion. Conclusion. We are at least provisionally, warranted in taking intentional agency, alternative possibilities, and causal control over one's actions to be real phenomena. In other words, Liszt believes in free will because psychology and the other sciences most relevant to human behaviour state its key ingredients exist. Thus far, I have mainly rehashed other people's ideas. This last section is an attempt at blue sky thinking. Firstly, I think that the indeterminism displayed by evolution meshes well with the idea of indeterminism in organisms. It's posited by scientists that the first life on Earth appeared when macromolecules became able to duplicate themselves via quantum genetic mutation, and further quantum mutation made these single cell organisms multicellular, and then led to large animals like fish, dinosaurs, and eventually humans. And this 2017 study supports this idea. These quantum effects clearly show that determinists are simply wrong to say there is no significant indeterminism at the macroscopic level of organisms. This is the case in animals, plants, and microorganisms. Now, it is accepted by all that you cannot have free will without consciousness. This raises the question of when consciousness arises, because clearly some organisms have conscious will and others do not. A bacterium does not have conscious will, human beings do. I believe that we have to explore a naturalistic account of conscious free will that places humanity, or Homo sapiens, in its proper context as a species of mammal that has achieved exceptional success. And this is not to degrade us to mere beasts, but to understand our long history. I think a plausible hypothesis for how the first glimmers of consciousness, which is awareness of oneself and one's environment, arose, is that an undetermined genetic mutation happened. This would have been for an aquatic life form in the Ediacaran period from 635 to 541 million years ago, when dozens of complex multicellular animals emerged. It's clear that being aware of one's surroundings would be an evolutionary advantage that soon proliferated through natural selection. If there's a subsea boiling hot lava vent, it's useful to recognise it's dangerous and swim away. Now, we can view consciousness as a continuum, as are most things, and so early semi-conscious animals would be nowhere near the sophistication of a human. They would have limited senses, perhaps only touch, their central nervous systems would be poorly developed and unable to make much sense of the world. Later, animals develop more senses and form languages so they can communicate with each other, which means the species can pool its knowledge, improving consciousness. 
These include octopuses, ravens, dolphins, our ape-like ancestors, and eventually humans. Humans possess an incredible brain, unsurpassed stamina, and great dexterity. Our cerebral cortex is amazingly developed and allows us to have empathy, episodic memory, many emotions, ethics, and a sense of self. All of this sets us apart from other animals and provides a strong argument for conscious will existing in humans and against epiphenomenalism. Now, I think that consciousness may allow us and other animals to break the chains of causality that largely shackle rocks and bacteria. There is a precedent for such a powerful causa sui other than quantum mechanics, and one which to me irrevocably dethrones the determinist dogma of no event without a cause, and that is the Big Bang. This is when something came from nothing, and I believe it makes agent causal free will more plausible. And since consciousness exists on a continuum, this would indicate that the conscious free will may exist on a continuum. A centipede has a relatively tiny brain with very limited self-awareness, but nonetheless may allow it to act freely in a few limited circumstances. A chimpanzee, our genetic cousin, has much more self-awareness, which may allow it to act freely in a moderate number of circumstances. A human has the highest amount of self-awareness in the animal kingdom, and so it may well be able to act freely and break causal chains in almost all circumstances. And since free will can be broken down into our mental freedom to think and our physical freedom to act, some humans have more free will than others. For example, picture a slave. His freedom to act is reduced by his chains, and his freedom to think, to have an independent will, is reduced by how his master conditions him to obey like a beast and not think. Physical constraints and mental conditioning has reduced his free will by limiting his freedom of action and his freedom of thought, respectively. Thus, even if the master took off his physical chains, his mental chains would remain, reducing his free will as his independence of thought is greatly curtailed. If this line of thinking is furthered, compatibilism is shown to be even more hopeless than before. For example, what if, as is theoretically possible under compatibilism, this breaking of the spirit, this brainwashing, were absolute, such that whatever command his master gave, it would always be obeyed. You can see this kind of breaking of the spirit in the novel 1984, where Winston has been released from prison and torture after being brainwashed by the party. Winston now makes decisions like whether or not to keep a diary, and I, the compatibilist holds these decisions are of his own free will because he does not have any physical restraints like ropes. But in reality, Winston is still a slave because his decisions are made through the indirect will of Big Brother. They are determined by others. Saying Winston is free because he has the illusion of choice clearly demonstrates the absurdity of compatibilism. Having your mind's thoughts determined by Big Brother the man is really little different from having them determined by Big Brother the universe. Therefore, freedom of action is not free will, and free will is incompatible with determinism. This brings me to my next point, which is that free will may be something you can choose to exercise and strengthen like a muscle. A man who does not make the effort to think, who simply chooses to follow others, who rarely crafts original thoughts, who blindly accepts an ideology or a religion, is not exercising his free will. His free will muscles waste away, and his ability to genuinely choose between different options shrinks. A man who makes the effort to think critically, to question, to probe established dogmas, draw new connections between ideas, and better himself, is exercising his free will to the utmost. His free will muscles grow stronger and his ability to genuinely choose between different options expands. He is still constrained by his genetics, his parents, his friends, the laws, but he feels able to set aside the rules more easily. This man is praised by all. He is Alexander the Great. He is Catherine de Medici. He is Winston Churchill. A useful image is that of a man attached to a spot. 
representing comfort by a spring, representing the constraints that act on him. When that man stretches, moves out of his comfort zone, despite all of the determinist factors straining to pull him back, then he uses his free will. Some incredible individuals achieve so much they can almost be said to snap the spring of determinist constraints. Take Alexander the Great. At age 20, he became king of Macedonia. 13 years later, he had conquered the mammoth Persian Empire after fighting in the front line of countless gargantuan battles and instituted Greek culture in the East, where it lasted for a thousand years. Despite us being aware of several contributors to his success, like good officers, phalanx infantry, and companion cavalry, it still amazes people to this day. It seems incredible to say Alexander could never have failed his immense undertaking as determinists hold. I now turn to the conservative aspects of this video. David Hume is a founding father of conservatism and was a compatibilist, a soft determinist. And even though he was wrong about determinism, he still possessed that essential conservative trait, scepticism. He expressed uncertainty about his own carefully worked out opinions. It is this intellectual modesty which is so lacking from free will deniers. They claim absolute certainty in what is really a very uncertain picture. Conservatives have always doubted anyone claiming absolute certainty about an idea. They know that so many ideas have come into and gone out of fashion. So many of yesteryear's certainties have vanished. They look with amusement on those who claim to have discovered the one truth, whether it be evangelical Christianity, absolute reason, or fascism. And just in case anyone is tempted to believe in determinism based solely off what progressive experts say, conservatives keep in mind that for much of the 20th century, virtually every progressive expert was united in thinking that socialism was historically inevitable in what must be counted as the biggest mass delusion in history. However, the rather self-satisfied type who proclaimed the historical inevitability of socialism and laughed at all the plebeians who continued to believe in capitalism was comprehensively disproven by the fall of the USSR. And so it may be with free will deniers. Conservatism also thinks of the moral dimension. It is always stressed preserving the best parts of the past and fanatical absolutists who want to sweep away the old order pose a threat to that. Humanity has always had an intrinsic belief in free will, long before the term itself was first written in the 4th century AD. This belief is one of the best parts of humanity, and so it would be folly to try to destroy it based on what may well turn out to be fallacious arguments. Conservatism is a child of the Enlightenment, so conservatives should be wary of claims that thought experiments can be conclusive in the debate. Thought experiments are artifices of reason and contain hidden assumptions or ambiguous terms within them that greatly reduce their usefulness. Empirical evidence is best. Now, my cautious belief as a conservative that free will may exist responds to the evidence. Therefore, I detail an empirical experiment that would convince me that free will is almost certain to not exist. An experimenter splits a fertilized egg into two genetically identical embryos, both of which are grown for nine months in artificial vats under exactly the same conditions into babies. They are then placed into identical rooms alone until they are adults. Every variable must be identical. Food, drink, intensity, temperature, noisiness, humidity, etc. Then, the experimenter introduces a stimulus a large number of times. If both adults' reaction to the stimulus is exactly the same each time, or as near as makes no difference, then I would accept that the likelihood of free will existing is near zero. Earlier, I mentioned that Christian List thought psychology the most relevant level of science for explaining how the mind works, and thus if we have free will. I differ from him, as I think neuroscience is actually the most relevant level and delivers the best insights. Some neuroscientists believe in free will, some don't, 
and most declare they can't know yet. This majority neuroscience consensus of uncertainty further drives me to hold the same belief. In any case, I personally believe it will take another 200 years before neuroscience is advanced enough to answer the question. Before I conclude, I reiterate that the strongest and cleanest argument for free will is fundamentally most people perceive they are greater than the sum of their parts, that we are not just complex machines, but they can genuinely choose between different options. Our mind's perception of free will is very strong. And why should we trust our mind's perception? Because our mind allows us to thrive on this planet, which proves its competence. In conclusion, there is no way to know whether free will exists at present, and so it is both incorrect and morally reprehensible to state it is absolutely certain it does not exist. This is because determinism has proven false and quantum mechanics and thermodynamics proves the universe is fundamentally indeterminate, which lays the ground for agential indeterminism, that is, free will. Furthermore, this indeterminism can be accessed by the human body, as shown by evolution and our senses' ability to detect microscopic quantum particles, which means there is indeterminism in human decisions, further improving the possibility of agential indeterminism. In addition, a plausible hypothesis has been put forward that conscious free will is an emergent phenomenon not reducible to atoms merely smashing into one another, which is backed up by the best theories of soft sciences, notably psychology. Psychology currently analyzes human behavior from the starting point of an agent with free will, which is counterbalanced by biology's view of human behavior as mechanistic, leaving an overall unclear picture. Neuroscience is the discipline that promises the most to answer the mystery, but it is still very young, and its theory is highly likely to change. This is seen in Libet's flawed experiment being supplanted by Scherger's more advanced one, which not only provided strong evidence against free will denying epiphenomenalism and for conscious will, but also demonstrated how important it is to have caution with experimental conclusions. This caution, this inherent scepticism, is the hallmark of conservatism, which understands that everybody in the past who has declared absolute certainty in an idea's veracity has been wrong in a large or small way, far too often with severely negative consequences. Because it is clear from current fatalistic societies and common sense how corrosive a lack of belief in free will and feeling yourself not to be ultimately in control is, conservatives prefer to maintain both the natural human belief in it and the admirable Western tradition of emphasizing it until conclusive evidence appears. Our mind strongly perceives that we can genuinely choose between different options, which is significant evidence for free will and cannot be ignored. This perception of unpredictable free conscious will is strengthened by our observation of how animals with even a smidgen of consciousness behave quite unpredictably, indicating consciousness exists on a continuum and allows its possessors to break causal chains. So, quantum indeterminacy, psychology, our mind's perception, and conscious beings' unpredictability all add up to challenge strident free will deniers, leaving a far murkier picture than those who like everything simple. But the mystery of human behavior defies simple answers. Free will has been debated for two and a half thousand years by humanity's greatest thinkers and will likely be debated for hundreds more. Surely, therefore, it is time to remind ourselves to have a little intellectual modesty and patience.